welcome everyone to our the CEE's TEP program, Square Root of STEM, Building Robots. Square Root of STEM is where we explore a variety of topics that illustrates the interdisciplinary nature of STEM and the real world applications of STEM skills. Following all sessions, the speaker um, videos, presentation slides, and supporting materials are loaded onto our TEP lab bench for teachers to access and use in their classrooms. The Center for Excellence in Education was founded in 1983 by Joanne De Janeiro and Admiral Rickover, who is the father of the nuclear Navy and civilian uses of nuclear power with a mission to nurture high school and university scholars um, of excellence and leadership in STEM. Our programs for teachers and students are our Research Science Institute, or RSI, our USAVO, USA, by Olympiad, our teacher enrichment program, and our STEM license too. Um, today, we're excited to have our distinguished guest, um, Juan Liu, uh, who is the founding partner and board member and president of uh, Mugen in, uh, Incorporated. And he is also an RSI alumni from 2005, so we're excited to have him. We have Andrew um, Chatham, who is a distinguished software engineer with Waymo. And we also have David uh, Zhou, um, who is the project manager um, at Google, who is also an RSI alum. Without further ado, we will have uh, Juan Lu um, introduce and present. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Juan Lu. Um, people also call me Jim at RSI. Uh, it's really my honor to be invited here to uh, share my STEM experience. Um, so I love robots. And uh, uh, so today I want to talk about you know, building robots with friends. And, and so since my, I built my first robot, it's been uh, 20 years. So it all began in um, 2001 uh, in Beijing. Uh, it's, uh, at, this photo was taken at the National Robot Firefighting Competition. So uh, I was the second youngest uh, member on the team at the time. So I followed and learned a lot from my uh, teachers and uh, fellow schoolmates, teammates. Um, uh, during that competition. So the competition was actually about uh, uh, making a robot uh, to find and put off a lit candle uh, in a maze. Um, so I came up with the idea of uh, you know, using water uh, instead of uh, just electric fan to put off the candle. Um, and then I was actually for the first time in the competition to, uh, to do that. Um, uh, but unfortunately, I think uh, so my uh, you know, my robot worked in all the trial runs, but uh, because I later on I found out that I didn't cover the circuit boards well enough. So, you know, basically every time I, I made a successful trial run, the water got onto the circuit board and then, you know, so the actual real run um, couldn't really work function. And then later on when the water dries out, right, the robot would work again. But anyways, I didn't know that. So I actually didn't really win any prize. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I think I got lots of, still got lots of encouragement from my uh, teammates. And then the, just the excitement from putting together everything, all the mechanical parts, electrical parts, programming parts together, uh, still was really like uh, interesting and then really got me hooked into robotics. So this uh, was a photo taken, I think three years later in Shanghai, my hometown uh, at the World Engineers Convention. So, uh, at that time, I think three years later, I already became like the team leader of our robot club in the school. And then uh, we actually have become very independent. And uh, thanks to our coach, uh, really, uh, you know, style, uh, he's very hands off. But, uh, you know, after teaching us all the uh, key concepts and how to do things, um, basically, he will let us do everything, uh, everything by ourselves. From, you know, choosing the, the topic of the projects to uh, design to implementation. So we pretty much did everything on our own. And then we also run, ran our own lab um, and then proudly brought two of our inventions to this uh, uh, expo. And actually uh, three out of uh, the five um, students in this photo uh, later on got PhDs. Um, uh, I mean, I actually did it. So this was taken uh, in 2005 uh, in Boston at RSI. Uh, actually, it's, it was uh, right before the final presentation. Um, so. Uh, I was really um, fortunate to uh, to actually go to RSI to go to MIT. Actually, it was also my first time going abroad. I worked with my RSI mentor, uh, John Gallinato, um, from Good Self. It's uh, like a, a, a 
you know, basically it's a, a startup doing like arts and science, um, um, I was education uh, with, uh, with Media Lab, MIT Media Lab. And then, so I uh, made an educational robotics kit uh, for 10 year olds to actually um, basically create interesting games with Lego and uh, Excel. So basically you specify the logic in uh, an Excel spreadsheet and then you're able to, you know, move the robot and then, you know, these sensors um, basically, um, you know, built from Legos. Uh, that was a fun project. And then after ISI, I applied to MIT and then um, this uh, fo it was photo taken uh, in, the, in the lab at MIT. Um, basically, um, I, I built a robot garden with a bunch of uh, classmates. It, uh, we, we made a, like, we put a robot arm on a mobile platform and that, that robot can move around and look at cherry tomatoes and then pick them. Um, that was also really fun. So this photo was taken in Palo Alto in 2010 um, at a, a robot workshop, training workshop. Uh, so it's called PR2, Personal Robot 2. So it was actually, uh, um, you know, these robots were made by an early Google engineer. So he was giving away 10 uh, robots to 10 robotics labs around the world uh, to encourage open source robotics software development. So I went to get one for MIT. And then, so uh, over there, I also met some of the smartest roboticists around the world. Uh, many of them actually in this photo uh, went on become really like founders of uh, hot robotic startups nowadays. Um, so uh, luckily also I was one of them. Uh, this is a photo taken in 2012, uh, an incub incubator in Shenzhen. So I uh, went to Shenzhen with uh, uh, some of my MIT uh, lab mates. Um, basically we were uh, trying to commercialize a robot platform to allow people it's more like a robot kit to allow people to try out open source robotic software. And then later that year, um, I actually moved to Tokyo, Japan, um, to join uh, Ross and Biankov, uh to start a robotics company uh, focused on making industrial robots smart. Uh, so Rosson got his PhD from CMU, and then he is the author of a very popular open source robotics uh, software. Um, platform. And then I have known and admired him for many years, uh, since 2008, when I was doing undergraduate research uh, at MIT. And then finally met him in person uh, in Palo Alto at a robot workshop. Um, so originally I was planning on going back to university lab because that was the only place I thought I could meet uh, similar people like me uh, who are really, you know, live and breathe robot, robot, robots every day. So after uh, visiting him on my way back to the States from Shenzhen, uh, I am convinced that like, you know, I could build uh, a career I have been, you know, basically dreaming of in Tokyo. So our very, very first office uh, you know, was actually renovated from a, a three-story apartment building's uh, bike garage. As you can see, it was really a tiny space. Uh, so this, this is in 2013, our very first attendance uh, in, the, in Japan's biggest robot exhibition. Um, at the time, we didn't even have our own booth. Um, it was really tiny, as you can see. Um, so this, uh, at the front was Issei talking to the customer, and Rosson and I, we were actually sitting in the corridor uh, outside the booth, um, you know, trying to uh, make the, uh, yeah, make the code work. And then on the right side, you can see actually we made a, a very pretty uh, cool demo, basic robots uh, transferring pizza dishes. Um, um, that, you know, Basically, we made robots do things that previously people thought that could never be possible, um, basically with uh, motion planning. Um, yep, uh, and then so that we can move existing software, um, uh, hardware, uh, make them really uh, smart. Uh, this was in uh, 2014. Um, our, basically, um, at the time, the team has grown to more than five people. And then as you can see, this time we actually had our own booth and then we we're able to do some programming in our own space. And this was in um, 2014, I'd seen a car factory. Uh, this was our very first system uh, in production, um, in 24 seven production. Um, basically we managed to uh, move a giant laser cutting machine um, that cuts like spare parts for, for bands. Uh, this uh, was taken in 2015, the team has grown to more than uh, 10 people. This is, uh, also in 2015, um, 
uh, in like uh, photos uh, taken from a car factory and also like food warehouse uh, where we make some robots pick uh, sandwiches. Um, it's actually in a pretty, uh, it's like a big freezer. Um, every day after midnight, uh, it starts production so that you get, people get fresh sandwiches in the morning. Uh, this was 2016, we, um, we were uh, helping um, with like automating um, some of the, um, you know, biggest e-commerce warehouses in Japan. Also in that year, uh, my son Max was born. Uh, this was taken a little after, uh, uh, actually in 2017, uh, I took him to the lab. So in 2017, I moved um, actually uh, back home for work after 10 years, um, uh, basically to help uh, one of the biggest e-commerce uh, makers in China um, to do like full warehouse automation. So we were able to help them uh, make the full process automation for the first time um, from you know inbound all the way to outbound. Uh, we helped uh, you know put robot systems there. It was the very first one in the world to have achieved full process automation. And then, so as we continue to work hard, um, so the uh, you know same old customers start to give us more projects, and then we are able to also put more robots into more you know different customers' factories and warehouses, and then just um, um, yep, we got just uh, more and more uh, orders, and then uh, you know the team also has grown bigger and bigger. So we're able to move into more warehouses in different industries and uh, factories. And then another milestone we have achieved was, uh, I think, uh, in 2021, uh, we basically have deployed our very first um, project in the States. So it was like a joint collaboration between our, among our teams in, uh, in China, Japan, and America to actually uh, create a fully automated system with just, um, you know, one robot that, that replaces, you know, conventionally you are, or might require a whole production line. So that actually uh, takes full advantage of our uh, technology. And uh, so now we are, um, you know, operating in you know, three countries um, and then with people uh, from, you know, almost 30 different, different regions. And then we all share one dream. So it's been, um, you know, really quite a journey. And then I think, uh, it's yeah, I'm really uh, lucky and happy to be part of this process. So yep, so this is uh, part of my uh, my uh, presentation. Thanks. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing. And I know that I have a few questions, and I'm sure that there are some 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 questions out there. Um, so next we'll have our next presenter, um, Andrew Chatham. Hi everybody. All right, let me see if I can get this presented. All right. Do we see my screen? Yeah, yes. all right. Cool. Uh, good to meet everybody, except I can't see you. Uh, my name is Andrew Chatham, um, and I am going to spend most of this presentation just kind of going over what Waymo is. We made ro robot cars. It's really awesome. Um, but I'll give a little bit of biographical background, um, not quite as much as Jim. Um, but that was super interesting. All right, so real quick on me, um, I am originally from Mississippi. Um, I had the really good fortune to go to RSI in 1997, where I did microbiology research. And that is where I learned I did not want to do biology anymore. Um, I thought I was really into biology, um, and working in a lab was a very different experience from studying it, um, and that's great for a lot of people, but it wasn't really for me. Uh, I then attended Duke, uh, where I got my bachelor's, um, that's where my education ended, and there I studied economics and computer science. Um, I just, due to how things were set up, got a lot more attention in the computer science department, and so I uh, just got really more interested in that, right? And I think getting the attention of the professors and being able to spend time with everybody just like made me a little more excited about it. Um, I graduated in 2002 into the dot-com bust, where not a lot of places were hiring computer programmers, but Google was. Um, and that was kind of a small place at the time, and I joined that. It turned out to be a really good decision. Um, it is now one of the biggest companies in the world, but at the time there were about 125 or so engineers. Um, and I worked on web search and cloud stuff, um, did a lot of like back end work. 
Um, and then around 2009, I started to get a little bored um, and started thinking about what else I might do. And I got really excited about robot cars. And I looked around to see if there were companies I could join to work on robot cars. Um, they had just done the uh, DARPA challenges, which was a, a setup where the government sponsored teams to try to drive robot cars through the desert. And it was like really exciting. And in the first version of it, cars made it, uh, I think the, the winning team made it 10 miles and then it went to a ditch and its tires caught on fire. Um, and the second year team, all the teams or several of the teams made it to the finish line. It was really exciting stuff. And I wanted to work on this. And there were really companies doing it. Then I found out Google was doing it. And so I got to transfer internally and join what is now called Waymo. Um, but was at the time the Google self-driving car project. Uh, and that's been really interesting for me. I've loved it. It's a fantastic project to work on. I'm really excited about transportation and cities. Um, robotics is something I've grown into. It's not that I was always excited about doing robotics, um, but it's been really interesting. Um, I'm using a lot of math that I learned a long time ago and never really used, even in my time at Google as a programmer. Um, so it's just been fascinating. So that's enough about me. Um, and then I'm going to tell you guys a lot about just like what Waymo is and what it is we do. Um, and these are much higher produced <laughs> slides than what I showed you. All right, so our mission is to make the world's most experienced driver um, to help people and goods get where they want to go. We don't need to make this too complicated, right? Like there's lots of cars, um, lots of places people want to go, lots of places we want things to go. And we spend an awful lot of time trying to do that. Um, and it's very dangerous. There are um, over a million deaths in across the world each year. Within the United States, it's somewhere between 30 and 50,000 deaths per year. It is um, one of the leading causes of death for young people in the United States. And most of the time, this involves human error. Um, it's not necessarily the only factor, but humans can get distracted, they can get drunk, they can look at their text messages, uh, and that leads to accidents. They can only really pay attention to one thing at a time. And a really big advantage of computers is that they don't necessarily suffer from those same problems and they can pay attention to lots of things at the same time, have really good reaction times and look all around them. Uh, and so that is why we have been working on this problem. Um, so we have been, we started this in 2009. Um, I joined the project about two or three months into it. Since then we have driven over 20 million miles on public roads. So we put our software on cars that we have expanded on and I'll show you about it later. We've driven 20 billion miles in simulation. We don't want to test every last thing we come up with in the real world. And so we do a lot of testing in the cloud first uh, before we put it on the road. And we've driven in lots of different cities and states. All right, so I mentioned um, earlier in this process, there was the DARPA challenges, uh, lots of academic and you know early industry excitement on this and didn't really turn into anything until Google decided to start the self driving car project. And that's where I joined in. Um, since then, we then formed our own company called Waymo. This is a subsidiary of Google's parent company, Alphabet. Um, and it's just been a fantastic project. We originally um, began just trying to see if we could do this at all. Um, and we have now transitioned to the point where we have cars driving with nobody in it, taking people where they want to go. Um, in the early parts of the project, we thought we would do something um, similar to what you can buy from some car manufacturers where it would just drive for you on the freeway. What we saw was that people would not pay attention, even though we told them the system wasn't perfect. Um, so these were people, these were Google employees that we'd let take the car out for the weekend. And we said, look, this car is not perfect. You need to pay attention. But as you can see from these videos, people got distracted. And that made us really nervous. Um, and we decided not to continue along that project. And instead, we went back to the drawing board and said, you know what, we just need to drive the entire trip end to end. And we can't, and this is someone falling asleep, we can't have people like going in and out of the driving task. That's too dangerous and asking them to do something they're not prepared for and because they don't want to do. Um, and so we've been instead focusing us on what's called level four driving, where at least in some circumstances, we will do door to door driving. Um, and then level five is that, but everywhere it's a little mythical. All right, so our first uh, fully autonomous deployment was in 2015. Uh, the man you see in the car there is named Steve Mann. Um, he was a good partner to us. He uh, was a leader of a local blind association. He is legally blind, cannot drive. Uh, his commute was something like two and a half hours each way on public transit. And you know, he's just a really good partner for demonstrating the value of this technology. 
This was the bubble car we did kind of in the early days of the project, um, back when no one really knew about self-driving cars. Robots were kind of scary, and so we wanted something really cute uh, and non-threatening, and I think we really pulled that off. Uh, these are no longer on the road, but they were a really good first way to deploy the technology. Uh, we then became Waymo and moved on to a minivan. We have developed all of our own sensors that we put on the car, and I'll go into a little bit of that in a second. So I'm going to skip the video parts of these. Um, so, well, actually, let's see what's. All right, we don't need to see the entire thing, but um, thank you for humoring me there. So we've developed the driver, right? So we want to build the software and the technology that helps the car drive, but we're not building the car itself. We did that in the very early days with that cute little bubble car, um, but there's lots of different things you could put this on and we don't want to be in charge of all of that. And so we're developing a generic system that we can put on different platforms. And so you've seen the minivan, there's a SUV we're using now. We're also putting it on semi trucks um, to, you know, send goods around the country and, and their future vehicle platforms coming in the future. All this really exciting stuff. And we're trying to solve the driving problem and not necessarily the car problem. Uh, all right. So I mentioned hardware. Um, we have lots of our own sensors that we built on the car. And then, you know, I'm a software engineer. We work a lot on software. We have different kinds of sensors on the car and they all have different uh, pros and cons and they complement each other and fill in for each other's gaps. The first is LIDAR. This is laser range finding. So there is a laser, uh, actually a couple of lasers that spin around and give a 360 degree, 360 degree view. And the really nice thing about LIDAR is that it gives you points in space. So X, Y, Z coordinates. And if you get a bunch of these, you can form what's called a point cloud. And it sort of looks like the thing you're looking at in 3D. Um, and so you can see a bicycle or a stop sign or even a curb or a pothole. Um, and LiDAR is really good at giving you just a really rich view of the environment. A downside of it is it, you know, it reacts like light. It can't see through opaque objects like a truck. Um, and it reacts poorly to fog and rain the same way that you have trouble seeing in fog and rain. That is complemented by cameras. Um, I think you guys know what cameras are, but the reason they're really useful in a self-driving car is because some things just require color. If you want to know if a light is green versus red, that requires color and LiDAR is monochrome. Uh, it's also just useful as a complement to the LiDAR. So if you see a blob of points and it looks kind of like a person, then having color information from a camera and confusing those together can give you much higher confidence that it's a person and not a statue um, of a person. Right? So that's really useful. And then radar is kind of the most exotic of all of these. Um, you've all heard of radar. Radar has really good valve properties. It can give you direct measurements of speed and velocity uh, via the Doppler effect, which is super useful. If you want to know that a bicycle is going 15 miles per hour, it can just tell you that instead of you having to kind of infer it by distance traveled. And then it can also basically see through other objects. So if you are at a stop sign and there are four cars in front of each other, it can actually see the car like at the front of the line, um, which, you know, you can't see with your naked eye necessarily. That's really useful when you want to react to lots of cars. And all of these sensors we have looking 360 degrees, so we're always paying attention to everything going on around us. All right, there you go. Uh, software, this is what I work on. Um, so I am in charge of infrastructure, which is a really big grab bag of stuff. Um, so it includes security, maps, user experience, um, uh, engineering operations, which is the operational component to how we develop things. So doing data labeling, um, examining how the car behaves, um, uh, all, all the cloud stuff um, under me. So kind of a grab bag of stuff, but it's all very exciting and software, right? All right, so the way the car works, we are in the middle of somewhere uh, and we use a map to figure out where we are, right? The map, you, you guys have seen maps, obviously. Um, these are way more detailed than that. They know every crack in the road, where the storm drains are, um, exactly where every crosswalk is, way more detailed than what you're used to seeing. And then we can place ourselves on that map and that gives us a really ind good indication of what's going on, right? Like even if you didn't know where any objects are, you know that 
you want to go left, that you need to stop at a stop sign, that there's a crosswalk in front of you. Um, on top of that, we then detect stuff, and this is called perception, which is where we take all that sensor data we just talked about, and we turn it into structure. Uh, and structure might be there is a bicycle going 50 miles per hour, and we, you know, it's right over there. Uh, and then on top of that, we need to know where they're going. So is that bicycle going to turn left? Are they going to yield to us? Is that pedestrian going to cross the street? Uh, and then once we've got all that stuff, we drive. Right. So at the end of the day, there's a steering wheel and there's a gas pedal and a brake pedal. And we're not literally pressing those things, but conceptually, that's the output of a self-driving car, you know, that plus the blinker. Um, and so all that complexity, all the software, all the hardware just kind of boils down into turn the steering wheel, gas and brake. Um, and that's what driving is. And it's a really hard problem, but we've made fantastic progress on it and we're pretty excited about it. Uh, let me skip this next video. Um, so here's an example of how this stuff all fuses together. Um, so this is us in an intersection on like one of our real maps. Um, you can see that we have detected there is a green light. You can also see that there was someone stopped at this intersection. And then you can see there's someone else who is maybe going a little fast. Uh, and what ends up happening is that we have predicted that they are going to run this red light. And, you know, I as a human driver don't know that I would have been paying enough attention to have noticed that. Uh, but because we're always paying attention and incorporating all this information, we can reason about that in real time. And then we throw up what we call a fence. So that red blob you see up there is saying, hey, we should not go past this for some reason. Right? And the reason in this case is someone's going to run that red light and we do not want to get hit by them. Uh, and so we ended up doing the right thing here. We stopped for that and we did not get hit by the red light runner um, and who to them. All right. Uh, so I mentioned um, we have a broad mission. We're trying to deploy this in a bunch of different places, um, including our trucking. Uh, we have recently, well, not too recently now, we launched a service called Waymo One. Um, so if you are in the Phoenix metro area, you can download our app from the Android or iOS app store. Like just get the Waymo app, sign up, and you can get a robot car to take you places. Um, you know, it works a lot like ride sharing services that you might have used, but it's driven by a computer. Uh, and we, you know, I'm really excited about this being the future of transportation. Um, it's really exciting stuff. Uh, I encourage you, if you happen to be in the area, to try it out. Um, we also have um, other programs in San Francisco, uh, other areas, um, but like the first place we really deployed this was in the Phoenix metro area, so exciting stuff. Uh, we have a really nice user experience inside the car. Um, this is one of my team's works on this. It really makes people feel comfortable. I mean, not people don't have a lot of experience with robots. They certainly could be hesitant getting into one for the first time. And so we have a really nice experience showing people what the car knows, right? It makes you feel a lot more confident if you can see, oh, it, it knows that bicycle is there. It knows that pedestrians can cross the street uh, and just feel more comfortable. And I've, I've seen a lot of people's first experience in a robot car. Some people get in really excited. Some people get in a little hesitant. By the end, everyone is a little bored, which is exactly what you want. You, if, if someone said, I had a really exciting taxi ride, that is not a compliment to the taxi driver. Uh, and so having people be kind of bored and looking at their phone by the end of the trip is a really nice thing to have. And, and I have seen lots of people do that. All right. Um, I don't know what I was going to say on that one. Um, yeah. So we now this is just open to the public. Here we see a car with nobody in it. All right, so now I can make you guys watch all of that, um, but I have myself taken a couple of rides in a self-driving, like completely self-driving car. It's super exciting, and then eventually you just kind of relax and look at your phone again. Um, exciting stuff. We are driving in much more complex environments these days. We've been driving um, in San Francisco, LA, New York, like just really trying to get this out everywhere. Of course, it's not like we just launched something on the App Store. There is actual cars and a physical real world we need to go out and interact with. All right, um, I'm gonna kind of skip to the end here because um, I've, I've maybe told you guys plenty about um, Waymo. Um, we're, we're also doing the trucking. Um, this is just a huge industry. Again, you know, it's very dangerous. We have people do this. People get very tired. It's very difficult to hire um, truck drivers. Uh, and so we think this is also another great thing to have in the future. All right, uh, I'll leave it there. So thank you everybody. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I did not know so much about selfless driving um, and the technologies that have kind of, I didn't know that, you know, they since 2009. Um, 
that's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you again for sharing. Um, all right, and to our third presenter, um, Mr. David Chio. Awesome. Well, yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, super, super grateful to have the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, and it's honestly going to be super hard following the presentations of two true experts in the field of computing, uh, but I'll try my best. Um, so my name is David Zhao. I'm originally from Seattle, uh, but currently live and work in the Bay Area. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of my experience uh, with STEM from childhood to today. And although I'm admittedly much earlier in my career than both Juan and Andrew, I, I do want to focus on talking a little bit about how teaching and, and teachers and mentors have played a massive role in helping me become the person I am today. Um, and my current work is a little bit further from the field of robotics, uh, but I will be talking about some of the research projects that I've worked on or led in the past that are a little bit more adjacent to robotics. Uh, a quick disclaimer that my presentation today is me speaking on my own behalf and not that of my employer or past employers. So as you can see here, my journey to STEM has really spanned a huge variety of things, right? It's everything from being a kid, uh, taking apart electronics around me. So yeah, kind of my, my journey in STEM spanned a huge variety of things. I, I did RSI um, in 2015 and then also led a couple of research projects with labs across Stanford, uh, as well as uh, with collaborators from the VA, uh, Microsoft Research, and even today, uh, I'm a PM at Google working on a sustainability project within Nest. But stepping back, my, my journey really started when I was a young kid. Uh, I had this uh, habit, much to my parents and pretty much everyone around me's dislike of taking apart everything electronic, right? No TV remote, no RC car, no laptop was safe. And I would always either be breaking things and screwing things, taking things apart. Uh, at that time, I was obviously too young to understand the kind of inner workings of these systems and circuits, but was always interested and curious about what made these things work. Um, but what I really credit both my parents and my teachers throughout my childhood is, is instead of getting angry or frustrating with this admittedly destructive habit, they saw it as curiosity and they really encouraged me to really dig deep, research things. And they in fact provided me with outlets for that curiosity. I even have this pretty uh, cool video from fifth grade during a period when I was obsessed with astronomy and, and researchers from the Worldwide Telescope asked me to create a tour about my favorite nebula. Hi, my name is David. I'm in fifth grade. I live in Ithaquah, Washington. I would like to tell you about my favorite nebula, the Eagle Nebula. The Eagle Nebula is a very large emission nebula located in the constellation Serpens Cauda in the Milky Way galaxy about 7,000 light years away. So I don't know if you could hear that, but I was basically just talking through uh, my favorite nebula, which is the Eagle Nebula. Uh, but then very quickly, in a blink of an eye, I was in high school, uh, where I am again forever grateful for my high school teachers, a few of whom were shown on the left here, who really just provided me with space to try things, fail, and then rebuild from those failures. And I think the lesson that really stuck with me the most was the idea of being comfortable with being uncomfortable right? Learning can oftentimes be a very uncomfortable process. And I certainly experienced that during Socratic seminars, where we learn the value of questioning our own beliefs, as well as critical thinking through debate, or in labs where we could pick a research question and uh, run our own independent investigations. And in that latter example, I can't count the number of times where an experiment that I had designed, whether in biology or chemistry, failed spectacularly. And what I appreciated was that teachers in those cases basically asked us to investigate what went wrong and write up a report on that mechanism of failure. And that idea of a post-mortem and that of a failure sometimes being just as helpful or insightful as a success has really stuck with me to today. And in terms of research, I was uh, really lucky to be part of the RSI class of 2015. The picture of our cohort is here on the bottom right. Uh, and that was a phenomenal opportunity in learning not only how to conduct academic research, but also how to best present and communicate scientific results. Uh, I had the opportunity to collaborate with researchers like Dr. Kapoor and Dr. Chowdhury at Microsoft Research on a robotics and HCI paper where we actually programmed small quadcopter drones to respond to quantitative measures of user affect. That's a fancy word of basically just saying it's your mood. Uh, and we proposed this interesting multiplayer game where success for your quadcopter, for example, flying higher or faster around a predefined track, would be inversely course, correlated with your affect or your mood. So as you got more excited that your quadcopter was in first place, you had to kind of self-regulate your excitement so that it wouldn't slow down or, or decrease in altitude. 
And then finally, I went to college at Stanford, where I graduated uh, mid-COVID in 2020 with my bachelor's and master's, both in computer science. Uh, my academic experience there was characterized by a ton of research, and I again had the true privilege of working under phenomenal PIs, including Professor Landay from the HCI lab. Uh, on the left here, this is actually a photo from uh, this past weekend on Saturday during my COVID makeup graduation. Uh, and then I also worked um, uh, with Professors Fei Fei Li, Silvio Savarizi, and Dr. Hawk from the Computer Vision Lab. Uh, as well as doctors Nazarali, Aman Atul, and Apple Boom from Stanford Medicine. And I am, again, forever grateful for these mentors for not only teaching me the ropes, right? They let me publish papers even as an undergrad. They let me address rebuttals from committee reviews. They let me present at conferences to cross-pollinate ideas with other researchers in the field. But then they also fully supported me when I went out and explored crazy, crazy ideas. And to make that a little more concrete, the photo on the left here is basically just some PVC pipe that I glued together, but it's meaningful because it's a real life example of that freedom to explore. I'll talk a little bit more about this project in a few slides, but this is basically just a jerry rig sensor harness for hospital operating tables that we built from PVC piping during late nights in the lab. Uh, we bought the supplies from Home Depot, we built and spray painted this overnight, and we installed it at Stanford Med the next morning and pretty much immediately got feedback from nurses and OR staff that this was both too bulky and too heavy. So we iterated, right? And we built the more, more lightweight prototype on the right. So this is just one small example of how my mentors and PIs allowed me to take the kind of more riskier path, right? Of prototyping these sorts of moonshot ideas, right? Putting cameras into the operating room. And then today, after graduating college, I started working as a product manager at Google, uh, and now I'm focusing on a new sustainability effort within Nest called Nest Renew. Uh, and this role really is, in essence, a culmination of my STEM journey, right? It requires a healthy dose of curiosity. It requires clear and concise communication for fairly technical concepts. It requires being okay with failure that happens all the time for different projects that we spin up, as well as just shooting for the stars. New shots are, are celebrated and accepted and encouraged. But I, I do wanna spend the remainder of my time today talking through a little more detail about the research project that I helped lead uh, back in my college days with collaborators from Stanford Med, as well as the Vision Lab called Passive Reduction of Operative Error. So when you picture an operating room in the hospital in your mind, you may envision a scene like this image, right? It's a serene, calm, but most of all, it's a controlled environment. And this calmness is really driven by the strict adherence of these operating room staff to procedures like the surgical count, which is basically the primary method to account for and manage all types of surgical instruments during a procedure. Uh, this is both a physical and manual process that really just falls under the responsibility of the operating room nurses. And to perform this count, they use a whiteboard and marker to denote counts. Uh, as shown in this image, this is from a real OR during a real, uh, a real surgery. But kind of actually like, like Andrew was saying in the case of self-driving, these processes are fundamentally human driven and they are very prone to mistakes such as miscounts, where there's a discrepancy between the number of counted and the number of deployed instruments. That just means the number of instruments, surgical instruments that are being used currently in the, in the surgery. And this occurs in up to one in eight hospital operations. And to quantify this impact, OR time is really costly. Uh, hospitals are expensive. They cost around $62 a minute. And every time a miscount happens, that's roughly $1,000. And that does not include the additional costs for things like x-ray imaging for the patient. And furthermore, we did an internal survey uh, on nursing staff and found that roughly 50% of nurses feel stressed about this count more than once a week. So this is a big problem. But worst of all, one in 70 miscounts leads to a surgical instrument being basically left in the patient's body post-operation. That's roughly a 100-fold increase in likelihood. And while rare, these sorts of never events, as termed by uh, the, the US National Quality Forum, are truly fraught with patient care implications, right? This leads to patient harm, reoperation, and in the worst cases, even death. This is a fairly well-known problem amongst anyone who's worked in an operating room, and existing technology has likewise been repurposed to try and solve it, right? Uh, as you can see on the left here, RF and RFID chips and their associated detector wands have been approved for the count and detection of sponges and are adopted widely by hospitals after showing uh, really great promise in reducing retained surgical sponges, right? Uh, they ran a study over, I think it was five organizations in four years that found a, over 90% reduction in these retention events. But these are super, super costly. It's like $200,000 for 20 ORs annually. And furthermore, these sorts of large RFID tags aren't suitable for being embedded in, in metal or small disposables such as suturing needles. 
And similarly, barcodes and data matrix codes have also been embedded into sponges and medical, uh, metal surgical instruments. And in fact, you, you can actually see here, this is a real photo from an operating room that uh, there's a scanning system that is currently being used at Stanford. Uh, however, the manual scanning process does introduce an inefficiency into the operating room. This requires significant additional staff training as well as time, which is very costly per case and, and per surgery. So given these limitations of existing technology, our hypothesis was that, hey, can computer vision enable the passive counting of a wider range of surgical items in the operating room uh, with greater accuracy? Uh, as it's important to note that both RFID and barcoding systems still require manual action from surgical personnel, and that's why we call them active approaches. So there's basically three main components. The first is we need visual data from the operating room. The second is that we need to train machine learning computer vision models to detect, count, and track these items. And finally, we need to create an interface so that the operating room staff can use to interact with our model outputs. So first, let's talk about the novel data sets that we collected, which includes the actual hardware that we built and iterated on, as I mentioned a few slides before, to collect that data. And to give some context, right, there's a lot of medical data sets out there. But the reason that we needed to collect our own data was that there didn't exist a data set of labeled surgical items uh, in the surgical field during live operations or during live surgeries. But in order to collect data from the hospital, we had to build hardware and basically install these cameras in the right places. And to find those places, we relied on the fact that surgical uh, items follow very rigid paths through the operative field, right? They start from the packaging to the back table, then in use in the patient, and then finally disposed of in the trash or returned back to the back table to be used or sanitized later. So we identified the back table and the trash as kind of our beachhead locations to be able to track these objects. And our first iteration was this PVC frame. This is that, that, uh, that uh, black frame shown a few slides before, actually mounted onto a real operating room table uh, during a surgery. We hand built and hand glued it. We had uh, cameras that captured both standard RGB video as well as depth and thermal. And here you can actually see feeds from all three of those uh, cameras during a few, few frames in a real operation. The camera here is pointing down at the back table. However, as I mentioned, we received super valuable feedback that it was too heavy, bulky, and noisy. So we created a new version, fully modular. It was much lighter, but also was made with stronger galvanized steel. Uh, and we had cameras that captured both RGB video as well as depth. And then exploring the depth capabilities, we were actually able to find that we were able to visualize millimeter width needles from even one meter away. You can actually see the faint outline uh, of the needle in the blue circle in the middle of the screen. This is a depth image, uh, which corresponds to the needle as shown. You can see the white string uh, in the kind of the standard picture on the bottom left here. So now turning to the data, we first collected and hand labeled kind of roughly 5,000 RGB images of five common surgical items. Then we sampled and labeled roughly 10,000 images from video that we collected from our first iteration of that sensor harness. Uh, installed in a live operating room. So this was during a real surgery. And we focused on laparotomy sponge detection. Those are the little kind of uh, white sponges that are outlined in green here as our beachhead because roughly 45% of miscounted objects are laparotomy sponges. And then we focused in on small textureless metal objects like suture needles. And we collected roughly 18,000 images of various sizes of needles and, and various conformations in a lab setting. And then we trained basically three models on these data sets. Uh, the first was a computer vision model that was able to detect laparotomy sponges during a real live operation. And you can actually see here, each green box corresponds to a detected sponge. But a, a big limitation of this model was that it required powerful computers in the cloud basically to run this detection. So we wanted to prototype a much smaller and a much more efficient model that could run in real time on that little board that you see right there called the TPU. Uh, and you can actually see those little green boxes in the, of the detected objects on the screen. But what was really cool is that all of the components needed to run real time detection could fit into a single like normal size briefcase instead of requiring expensive and internet connectivity um, dependent cloud computation um, and cloud servers. And then finally, we created a model to track those tiny little suture needles from a fairly large distance away from the table. You can see here that the green box shows the needle and the red box uh, tracks uh, kind of a scissor-like instrument called a needle driver. That's actually what surgeons use to handle needles during operations. 
And then finally, uh, there's an interface which we prototyped uh, and built an app for uh, kind of uh, with, with some operating room staff. Uh, so that operative personnel would be able to interact with the outputs of our models. Um, and you can see here, this is a, just a short snippet from the demo. And basically it's an iOS tablet based interface that would effectively replace that current whiteboard process that I showed uh, a few slides back. And instead of having to use a marker or eraser, the tablet interface would auto populate the expected items or the detected items from those ML algorithms. Um, and the operative personnel would actually perform the count using this tablet software, which would be able to track and record. Uh, so you wouldn't actually have to rely on physical pen and paper. And if a discrepancy and a miscount occurs, uh, the tablet will help document the time at which it occurred, allow staff to enter in relevant information. And again, this is all uh, standard practice for, for the operating room. So wrapping up, a couple of key STEM journey takeaways, right? Again, teachers, mentors, loved ones played an enormous role into shaping me who I am today. They celebrated curiosity. They taught me to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, they showed me the ropes of how to actually do academic research, but they let me run with these crazy moonshot ideas. Uh, and they taught me how to effectively communicate scientific results. And frankly, PMing requires all these skills. Wow, I am, I'm floored at this point um, with, with you guys and the work that you all are doing. And I mean, I guess broadly, um, what we can kind of gather from this is that we're using robots to solve problems. Um, and, and that's kind of what I gather from this. So whether it is in warehousing, whether it's selfless um, cars, whether it is in healthcare, we're using robots. Um, and that's kind of the connection, you know, for me that I'm making um, to solve these human problems that we have. And it also um, is used primarily to reduce waste or to reduce um, death in the case of, of self selfless um, or self-driving cars. So uh, let's see. And again, if you have any questions, you can um, post them in our Q&A um, chat, um, as well as visit our um, Facebook page or our, any of our um, um, programs which are um, posted in the chat. We do have a couple of questions. Juan. Um, this question is for you. So what are three interesting facts um, about robots that you can share uh, with us or in your work that you do? So um, I would say like, uh, because we, we work in the field of industrial robots. And then I, I think we, what really motivates, motivates us every day, um, even though like, um, because our robots actually are deployed in um, very severe environments, like for example, you know, Freezers I mentioned before, right? For for convenience stores, it's really cold and operates middle of the night. Car factories extremely hot in summer, very cold in winter. Uh, so so why do we want to do that? It's because we believe that robots are actually there to, especially industrial robots, are there to solve the problem of three Ds. So the dangerous one, uh, the dangerous, da dirty, and dull uh, tasks. So to free a human from you know those three Ds, and uh, I, I would say like, uh, and then we, um, you know, and then sometimes, you know, not only the environment, right, also we're under extreme pressure uh, from customers, for example, and I remember in one instance when uh, well, we were actually, our robots are, were, were, are, were being used to pick uh, cell phones and then people make orders online, right? Okay, I want to buy a, an iPhone, uh, which is pretty expensive, right, a thousand dollars, or, you know, I want to buy like, a, just a, like a dumb phone for my grandma. It's very cheap. It's maybe like fifty dollars, but uh, still, but uh, those orders are mixed in together. And our robots like just receive orders and pick them one by one. But uh, uh, you know, at one instance when we were just debugging and doing trial runs, actually somehow the robot just like in, in operation room, right? The robot miscounts, right? So so it sort of missed an object, and then 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 someone ordering iPhone might might be getting like a dumb phone and vice versa. So. So when that happened, because the warehouse was fully automated, it was operating so like efficiently. So basically from the moment someone clicks on the web page to it becomes a package and then gets put onto the truck going out, it takes only like 20, 20 minutes. And then when we discovered, discovered that there was a miscount, it, it were, that was already like, like maybe a few hours afterwards. 
So then everyone basically just stopped at the warehouse and rushed out to chase the truck, right? We have to really find the truck before it gets you know, sent to the delivery center uh, and then to people's uh, you know, rooms, then, then the company might get lots of complaints. So that's, you know, it's actually, you know, um, you know, really like stressful, but also like fun experience because, because then we will really appreciate our work if we get to uh, fix our bugs and then, then, um, you know, people don't have to, uh, being such like human operators don't have to be in such stressful situation, but, uh, we can actually just run things smoothly. And then good thing is once robot learns the mistake from the mistakes, then you don't, you, we can avoid them in the future. That's just one, one thing I'd like to share. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, our next question is to um, David. Um, one, congratu congratulations on your graduation. Um, you know, they say that it's better to be delayed than denied. So um, glad you glad you obtained that. Um, and being a former science teacher, I appreciate you, you know, kind of shouting out your, your teachers and inspiring you. Um, and with that, what can you share um, with teachers on encouraging um, that curiosity in a student, in a, in a David? What, what would you say to teachers to, to do? Yeah, no, that, that's a really good question. And I think there's a, a couple of things, right? The, the first thing is just like, uh, it's the perspective, right? Like when a kid is, is, for example, like breaking things, but not out of malice, but out of interest, right? Like reframing that in, in their mind as, hey, this kid is just really interested in what's happening, not like let's chastise this kid for uh, for for uh, breaking this TV remote. I think that's kind of one big thing that's just kind of a mental reframe. Uh, another one I think that I, I was really lucky to have was teachers who were incredibly hands on from from day one in terms of like they didn't want to just sit back and lecture us. And obviously, I, I see the great value in great lecturers and in great speeches. But uh, I think where I learned the most as as a kid. Um, and where I felt at kind of the peak of my creativity was where I got full freedom to actually explore something, right? Like uh, in terms of like a biology final project, as an example, where we could go out and just like, we would have, oh, oh sorry. sorry. Um, yeah, I, I think we could go out and just like uh, choose whatever interest we, uh, like whatever interest we had, we would have a budget. We would be able to buy the materials. We'd be able to actually craft a research plan and then actually execute it. And then again, whether it was successful or not, still be able to kind of write, present and share out our results. Like I, I thought that was really, really interesting because that actually really was what sparked my love for research. And um, this idea that, hey, you can actually push like the boundary of, of science, just a, a tiny little microscopic bit forward, but that represents completely novel work. And that is how scientific exploration happens. So. Uh, those are just a couple of things that I, I think, yeah, teachers have done a really incredible job. And so our next question um, is for um, Andrew. And um, the question is, you mentioned about being bored, um, that that's actually a good thing for, 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 for you guys to see. Is, is there anything in the works um, that would have the car interact with the riders? Yeah, yeah. Uh <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe I exaggerated a little bit on the board thing. Um, I mean, you, you you take a ride in the car. You, there's some expectation of em entertainment, right? And so we've got it set up so you can cast your own music, listen to your podcast or whatever, right? Like that's sort of what you would want to do in your own car. And one of the big benefits of not having a driver there is that you get to pick the music and there's no debate. Um, but we also like a lot of people just like watching what the car is seeing, right? Like seeing the real world rendered in 3D and understood by a computer is just kind of fascinating. Um, and some people just like, kind of like to watch, sit back and watch that flow by. Um, and it's pretty entertaining. But let's be clear, like some people are just going to sit there and look at Instagram and that's totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> right. And are they connect? I mean, I'm, I'm sure they are um, in some in some kind of way. Are they connected to um, you know, any additional power sources or the internet? Um, and is that required for the car to to move? <laughs> yeah, so the, the current car we're doing most of the development on is electric, and so that's it, right? Like, we plug it in, charge the battery, off we go. <laughs> and it's the same battery for running the computers and sensors in the car itself. Um, connectivity is an interesting question. They are connected to the internet. Um, that's a lot of what my teams work on. 
they don't require that. So we want to know where the cars are. And if someone asks us to go pick them up, we have to tell the car to go pick you up. Um, and so it's like required for that part, but it's not necessarily for safety. Um, it's, okay. it's useful to help it out. But if the internet disappears, we're not going to run into stuff. Okay. Okay. So I guess that, yeah, that was my question. So if, if there's like a, you know, the, the internet goes down or something and the car is just kind of out on its own. So that's not the case. That is awesome. That is awesome. Um, and I like that, you know, again, with the, what, what you mentioned um, in terms of like someone being blind, um, you know, this kind of solves that problem and, and reduces some of their expenses um, outside of maybe purchasing, um, different things, but that's, I, I love that. Again, we're solving problems um, using robots. And um, let's see, so our next question is um, for Juan. Um, so, and you of course shared a little bit of it, but why did you decide a um, career in robotics? Oh, um, because, uh, so it, it was just, just fun. Right. Um, so I, I, I was actually just uh, tinkering with, uh, I think like David with like all sorts of things at home. Um, before I could even like walk, I would already like climb up the wall and take off the clock on the, you know, on the wall to just take it apart. So I think, uh, yeah, just, just curiosity. And it's really fun to, to get things like just, just to, to figure out how things work. And then also sort of, you know, to make robots is like breathing life into like, you know, like a piece of uh, hardware. Right? So I think that that's really like, uh, it's really fun. And then also get to basically deal with lots of people, like really smart and hardworking people. I think that's also a great feeling because, um, you know, I, I mentioned that I was, uh, you know, thinking about going back to lab because that's where I, I can see me finding the highest concentration of similar people because we, usually in robotics labs, you see sleeping bags, pretty much under every like desk <laughs> because people just, because there's one famous saying in robotics is, um, you know, simulation is doomed to succeed. Basically you can make things work in software, but until you put it into the real world, it doesn't work. I, I, th I think Andrew probably also agrees really hundred percent with that. Uh, I mean, you know, often because of that, like, you know, things are just uh, a lot harder uh, to, to make it to, to actually work in real life. And then, just sitting next to a robot to see see it working and sometimes even failing. Uh, actually, sometimes whenever we want to catch a bug, that happens really rarely. Um, it's like a you know, celebration of the whole company, right? Like everyone will stop what they're doing and try to just rush over to see, okay, it finally happened. And that's like, you know, more than half of the work done, just, just to, to reproduce a bug sometimes is the most difficult part. And then that, that really like brings people together and everyone all the smartest minds get to work together on one problem. I think that that's a great point. Awesome. Yeah, and then you need experts from like hardware, software, all different things, and then all, in all aspects of engineering. And mm -hmm. then you get to learn from you know, peers every day. Uh, it's really fun. And then because we're serving also customers in different industries, we also get to learn how things are being made in the world. I think that's... Mm -hmm. yeah. You guys make me feel like I should have went into robotics. I was very similar. So I tore up a Nintendo, uh, some of my dad's um, watches that he had, um, just being curious on how things worked. Um, and that's how I connect with my students as well. Um, that's interesting. So um, our next question is to Andrew. And there's kind of two two part questions. So one is, um, there are there has to be a lot of input um, for data to be collected. So is are are there teams of engineers and programming and like how 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 is that set up in terms of the different levels organized to create what we experience? If you understand what, if you understand the question. Yeah. So there's kind <laughs> of two levels of this. Um, so one version is like, how do you make sure you're good at this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for that, you know, we do a lot of simulation. We like go out and test drive, right? And we try to put ourselves in difficult, but not like insane situations. Or if it's really insane, we'll do it on a closed course. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that. Um, but then also a big part of this and a part of like every one of the projects you guys have heard about is machine learning. And 
really since 2014 or so, this has sort of taken over all of computer science and like how everything happens is we got really good at building neural networks that if you feed it enough of the right kind of data, it will learn to make the right conclusions. And it's not magic. It's not thinking exactly, but it's really good at pattern matching. <clears throat> and so you, you can feed it enough pictures of bicycles and you say, this is a bicycle, trust me. Then eventually it will learn to detect bicycles. And so for that, you can either sort of figure it out on your own and say like, <clears throat> well, that thing is acting a lot like a bicycle, so we're confident, so we're gonna put that in the data set. Or you can have people draw boxes around bicycles and just do that a million times and feed it into the machine learning algorithm and it will pick things up. So both both approaches feed the beast. Hmm. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, let's see, so our next question, this is for um, David. So um, why did you decide on a career in robotics? Yeah, so I guess, yeah, uh, as I mentioned, like early on in, in childhood, I was always curious about like how things worked. And actually I had a particular fascination with RC cars and like RC boats, RC planes. Um, and that to me was just like, just hugely exciting, hugely interesting. I, I loved actually like uh, like true airplanes growing up too and riding on airplanes. It was just a, a, a kind of a magical experience on how those things flew um, as a child. So that kind of led me to this path towards um, drones. And, and I remember when the first, I guess it was like the DJI drone came out, it was this massive drone. And now they're a lot smaller. I uh, managed to get one. It was a, a birthday gift from my parents and uh, it was so much fun to fly. And then I was like, wow, like this is really cool. It's incredibly nimble, incredibly agile. So then that started me down the path of like kind of drone robotics research. Um, and then I, that, that took me through uh, some of the work that I did with Microsoft Research, um, as well as some work that I did at the Stanford Human Computer Interaction Lab, looking into like human drone interaction or more broadly human robot interaction, and more specifically the kind of distinction between um, user cognitive load uh, and, and user preferences between a, a drone that's actually safe to touch. Like if you imagine uh, covering a drone in kind of a, 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 a permeable mesh so that you could actually grab the drone for something like drone delivery, uh, how that compares to the standard drone. And we ran a bunch of experiments with a bunch of subjects, published a paper on it, and that was a ton of fun. Um, and then that kind of led me to the Stanford Vision Lab where I actually started off doing similar kind of grasping robotics, computer vision plus robotics tasks. Uh, I'm sure uh, Juan, his company does uh, basically a lot of the same kind of work. Uh, and then that's actually what got me into the broader like computer vision plus healthcare space. So it's been this kind of uh, stepwise function as I continue to um, uh, like explore different kind of passion areas. There's always this kind of tie back to robotics. Uh, so yeah, that's the journey. I have one final question, but it, it is to all three of you, um, starting with um, Juan and then Andrew and then David. And that question is, um, can you decide, um, can you describe the greatest um, challenge you've had um, in your field that you've conquered or mastered or had to kind of overcome? So, um, so because I work in the field of industrial robots and then they are actually not new uh, in this world. They've been used in car factories for decades. Side. But the way we control the move those giant robots, they're like, you know, like the one behind me, that's like almost a couple hundred kilograms or even a few thousand kilograms of weight, right? Those scary big robots. Um, people are really actually scared of them. And then the way we move them is, but before they, the way they move is actually they're being moved uh, by uh, engineers. Basically, human engineers would do this manual teaching process to really joystick the robot around record motion. So the robot will repeat and do the same action over and over again. But how we control those robots, we actually move them with, with computation. We actually use motion planning to actually drive those uh, robots. But then that becomes in some ways unpredictable, right? The robot sort of starts to know how to, how to perceive the world, how to decide the actions by themselves. And then people were actually scared of those giant machines moving on their own, right? So we, uh, we are really proud that we finally convinced our customers in factories and warehouses to trust that you know, our robots can actually move even in some safer way than the manually programmed robot. 
And because of, I mean, the benefit of obvious, like we can, uh, you know, have robots handle a lot of uncertainties. It can handle tens of thousands of different objects, right? Because you cannot just manually program for each one of them. And every day new things happen, pop up. Actually, the robots knows how to react and be safe around, uh, you know, just in different like uh, uncertain scenarios. So we're really proud of that. And we're gradually, you know, actually, you know, having those robots more act actually move from factory floor to warehouses into more uncertain uh, areas and applications. And then I think that's, that's like the biggest thing. You know, people say, what's your biggest competitor? We'll say like, it's just traditional human labor operation, right? And then we're trying to really have people overcome the fear of, you know, I mean, th these are dangerous robots indeed, but uh, we want to make sure that with technology, actually they can be more useful. Yeah. Awesome. All right, and Andrew? Yeah, to take a different tack on the question. So I'm not a roboticist. Um, I have an infrastructure background. And so for me, the big challenge is always making things big and fast. And that's been hard. And it's been great seeing that succeed at Waymo. Driven 20 billion miles in simulation. Like it's just an unfathomably large number. Um, and watching that system work and like it's it's got creeks, right? Like it's a big system, right? Like can we keep it all running. Um, just watching that happen has been fascinating. Like I've been on this journey since like the very beginning when just getting a car to drive it three miles an hour through a parking lot was a big deal. And it took us like an hour and a half to set up the car in the first place. And now we've got, you know, lots of cars on the road. People are setting them up with checklists and like they go off without a hitch and all the data comes in and like just watching that whole thing snowball is really satisfying. And I'm not the guy like figuring out how we steer across the bicycle, but I am the guy helping those people be really productive by just making everything really big and fast and convenient. And it's been really satisfying watching that work. Awesome. Okay. David. Yeah. So I, I think a, a huge kind of issue right now in broadly speaking, operating room um, tracking is the idea that like there are just hundreds, if not thousands of different types of surgical instruments that range in size, shape, color, and, and all sorts of things. And the operating room is a pretty cluttered, it's, it's a fairly small confined space, but there is very, very small objects, small textureless metal, metal objects like a, a suture needle are just a couple millimeters, right? Thick and, and maybe half an inch to an inch long. These are very, very small, right? They're, they're incredibly hard to even track with the human eye. And the goal, right, is that you actually want to track these uh, autonomously, right, with, with cameras. So I think there's a lot of work that uh, we were doing and a lot of work that's being done in kind of the broader computer vision community, research community around investigating how to detect, track, and, and basically uh, keep track of these small textures, metal objects. Awesome. All right. With that, I want to say thank you to our guest, um, uh, Juan, Andrew, and David, um, three RSI alums who um, took time out today to come and speak with us. Um, again, we appreciate you. Um, thank you, teachers and participants who came and joined us um, again. Um, if you would like to view this video at a later time, you can um, look in our chat and find those links. Um, it'll also be posted on our website and on our social media, as well as YouTube um, for later viewing. Again, thank you guys so much for coming. I learned so much. Mm -hmm.